school, when you would fill out what your parents did for a living, I would write trimmings, not knowing what the heck it was. When they opened up the window in the sweatshop, I used to go play on the roof. Is that a great place where you could play? I said, God, let the morning come <laughs> quick so I can go to my sewing machine. I think I'm nuts. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Sewing Community, the podcast where local Westchester area residents share their life and fabric and thread. I'm your host, Aaron Page, Director of Folk Arts at Arts Westchester, the officially designated Arts Council for Westchester County, New York. In December 2019, Arts Westchester began working with Amanda Browder, a Brooklyn-based fabric artist, to transform our nine-story building in White Plains into a cascading, colorful, large-scale fabric installation. All the stories heard in this podcast were collected from individual volunteers who have been involved in the building of this monumental work of public art. While this project is currently on hold because of COVID-19, our hope is that the stories shared here will in some small way sustain and deepen the social fabric of our sewing community. For the last several weeks, we took a short hiatus from the podcast, but as of today, I'm happy to tell you that we're back and we'll be releasing weekly episodes over the next several months. Today's episode features three Westchester residents, Chris Rodriguez, Deslin Downs Dyer, and Marianne Corbino as they reflect on the sewing and fabric stories of their ancestors. Hey everybody, my name is Chris, born and raised in Port Chester, New York, and I'm just relaying a story that uh, I remember being told many times by my grandmother and um, and Angie, who was my grandmother's cousin, who was uh, just a big part of our lives, a World War II generation of Italian descent. Uh, back during that time, in World War II, all of Port Chester was factories. There were so many factories in Port Chester, so pretty much everybody worked in a factory. And uh, uh, Angie was a master seamstress, and uh, growing up, we never had to uh, really launder our shirts or, or, or tailor our pants or anything like that. We had an Angie. You send your clothes to Angie, and Angie would gladly do them for us in a, without a sewing machine, and just a perfect hem. She didn't need a sewing machine. And she would sew whatever we needed, and she would uh, launder and just... Uh, it was like having her own private laundry mat. Uh, we had Angie. And Angie, during World War II, worked for a factory, a shirt factory, in Port Chester. And uh, during the war, they switched from making shirts to making parachutes for the troops. And Angie went from sewing shirts to sewing parachutes... Uh, for the troops in World War II, and she just took so much pride, and she loved telling that story, uh, that they uh, they were able to help out in the war, um, you know, the, the way they did in that factory, uh, sewing parachutes. So uh, that's my Angie story, and uh, God rest her soul. She was a wonderful woman, and that whole generation was just uh, just unbelievable, helping out any way they can, sewing parachutes uh, right here uh, in my hometown of Port Chester. My name is Deslin Downs Dyer. I live in Croton and Hudson. And we are currently uh, sitting at the Bennett Conservatory where my family runs a music school now in its 75th year. My husband's family, that is. I am excited today to be part of uh, Amanda Brower's installation project and hadn't really thought much about how the fabric itself connected to me because, one, though I find fabric to be beautiful and useful, I hadn't given it much layered thought but it occurred to me as I was here today surrounded by all this fabric and clearly stories attached to the fabric how close I am to the to the history of fabric I grew up on a small Caribbean island in Grenada where my grandfather uh, Lloyd Downs had many professions but one of them and one of the ways he made a living was as a tailor and so as a young girl I grew up with clothing that was always beautifully made and very tailored and perfect and my mother in turn uh, made a living for most of her young life as a seamstress and so I have a very vivid memory as a young girl going on a school trip uh, wearing a grayish bluish pantsuit that my mother had made for me and feeling really sort of superior <laughs> because I looked sharp <laughs> and um, <laughs> And the, so for me, there's this emotional feeling of something being made for you specifically with fabric 
that thought about you, your shape, what color looks good on you. Um, as a young girl, my mother tried to teach me to sew and I completely rejected that idea um, to this day um, until today when I sat down with my daughter who's 11 and who has been learning to sew in school and my eight-year-old who just learned to sew today with Amanda Brower. <laughs> I find this to be really interesting, the sort of um, the way we circle back to fabric connecting us to our families and memories and situations and life experiences. Um, so that's what I would say got out of today is that there's this incredible community spirit that's happening right now. But for me personally, and I imagine for everybody else coming through here, there's a real personal element about how fabric has connected them to places, things, people, and experiences that are meaningful. My family recently took our first family trip to Senegal uh, to attend a traditional Senegalese wedding. The thing that stood out more than anything else was just how beautifully clothed the women are in Senegal. And the fabric is so colorful and so well made and so tailored and beautiful. They're like art, beautiful visual things. And so I very much wanted some fabric. You, we couldn't find any ready-made pieces. So we went to the market to find fabric and uh, we came back with several pieces and one of the vibrant yellow patterned pieces was contributed to this project. Hopefully we'll see it flying above Art Westress's building and we feel really proud that if it does then we bring a part of Senegal and our experience to that project. But I think overall that probably is the bigger meaning of the project is our, um, that it's not just Amanda's project but it's everybody's stories being told in this beautiful way. Hi, this is Deslyn Dyer. It is September 28th, 2020. Many months since I've recorded for the Amanda Brower Fabric Project. Since we had the recording made about fabric and the fabric project and what fabric has meant to our personal lives, that fabric has taken on quite a different meaning in the last eight months. In March, we were in the midst of the uh, the installation project with Amanda, and then soon after, we were everyone really shut down. As we headed into March and April, masks were well the most basic thing to have in your toolkit to prevent us from getting the coronavirus. Immediately, the need to get masks or create masks um, was quite urgent, and as we all know, in the very beginning, it was very hard to get purchased masks and so people moved to making their own in our own town in Croton. An incredible group of volunteers got together and started the Croton Face Mask Makers, collecting fabric, sorting fabric, um, soliciting fabric, um, much in the same way Amanda was, but now for a really different purpose, um, communities getting together to sew and so the, the face mask makers have created so far about 35,000 masks. It's really incredible. And so the idea of fabric was uh, important and um, creating a mask for someone you loved was just such a wonderful gesture. Here in our home, um, some of our very first masks that we still have were the ones made and hand delivered to us. I think those are the most special to date masks that have been lovingly sewn for an individual given his gift and in terms of the skill of learning to sew I think that has also been um, on the rise. I talked previously about not wanting to learn to sew as a young girl and then feeling badly that I couldn't teach my daughter to sew when we met with Amanda on that uh, Saturday morning and watching her learn to sew through the project. Well my college roommate also had the same issue of sort of rejecting her mother's teaching her to sew and during the pandemic bought a sewing machine bought fabric learned to sew masks makes the most beautiful colorful and comfortable masks uh, for her friends and family and has been so successful at it that she now sells them i just wanted to sort of round out the use of fabric and how it continues to serve the most basic purpose of 
making people feel love, bringing people together at a time of great need. It's sort of something that we all have access to and can use in this way that makes us feel safe. And at the same time, beautiful, because the other thing about masks is that we were we quickly learn to personalize them. Your favorite color, your favorite logo, your favorite design. I have a friend here in Croton who started to make masks for brides out of lace that she found that belonged to, I think belonged to her her family. So I, I, I look forward to seeing how much more uh, fabric continues to shape our lives and our, and our togetherness. Uh, in the middle of a really dark time, it has been a really bright spot watching how mask making and mask sharing has brought us all together in a way. I'm Marianne Corbino. I live in White Plains, New York. Fabric in my family goes back many generations. What I'd like to tell you about is my grandmother. About a hundred years ago, she had eight children, and her husband had died from the Spanish flu, as well as the first two children. So she was left alone at the age of 30 as a widow with six surviving children. So she didn't know what to do, but her landlord said, oh, I'll give you some sewing. You can work on it at home and raise your children. But that wasn't enough. So think back a hundred years ago, women just didn't go into the workforce, but she had lived in Brooklyn, and she got up enough gumption to go into Manhattan and look for a job, and she ended up as a tailor for Macy's, and she supported her six children, and she was very musical. She bought each one a musical instrument and a piano, and she had her own band. In those days, women did not go out independently and work. And in her neighborhood, it was quite traditional, older Italian uh, women. And they were saying, oh, she's a widow. Look at her. What is she doing? She's going to work. How terrible, how awful. But the way my mother tells the story, she'd put on her gloves and her little hat, and she'd go into Manhattan every day, and she cut her hair short, which women didn't do at that time. <laughs> and it just sounds like she was very fashionable. I came from a long line of strong, independent women. My mom went on. She did a lot of sewing. She made all her clothes. She made all the drapes. And, everything. I like to sew. In college, I made antique vests. I would collect antique fabrics and I'd cut them and sew them into one-of-a-kind vests for um, men and women. And I made some tuition that way. Fabrics. My very first job, I was working as a sewing instructor for an organization called Consumer Homemaking and it was based in Yonkers, and it was to teach immigrants how to sew. And I got the position because I could speak French, and there were a lot of Haitian uh, people from Haiti, French speakers, and that was my very first job. I was 16 years old. Thank you for listening to Sewing Community. Please join us for next week's episode featuring fabric artists Kim McCormack and Rona Spar. 